a session. We have a task force who is monitoring COVID and all of the things that are happening in our response to COVID. And right now we are doing a couple of things. We've talked about this before, but in the sanctuary in particular, we've designated the two side sections as kind of um, separate seating sections. They are marked off. And so if you are feeling kind of like you want space, in our sanctuary right now, it's easy to be distanced, but just want to make sure everyone is aware of that. I want to remind you that we are going to be gathering after worship for a time of fellowship in the fellowship hall, and so I invite you to that as well. Those who are observant will see in just a minute that Travis is out, um, and so he is away for the weekend just enjoying time off, and so um, he will be with us next week, but please can keep him in your thoughts and prayers as he is traveling and away from us. The past couple of weeks, I've asked you if you're not getting emails from the church to send an email to the office and say, hey, add me to the list. I was been told this week that there is an easier way for you to do that. And so if you are not getting emails, go ahead and go to the church website and there is a button that you can even add yourself. And so if you're not in the loop and want to be in the loop, that is the easiest and the best way to do so. And so let me invite you to do that. Again, my privilege and my pleasure to welcome us as we gather to worship. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds as we gather together. Please stand if you're able for the call to worship. Please join with me in the responsive reading taken from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. God's praise will endure forever. The king of 
of glory, the King of all kings. This is amazing grace. Come on, everybody. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would cry my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings the chaos back into order? Who makes an orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Signs like the sun and in all his brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. I sing for all you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free, Jesus I sing for all that you've done for us. Shining in the light of your glory 
pray, come on. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Open up the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Come on, one more time. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open up the eyes of my heart. Open up the eyes of my heart, Lord. I, I want to see you. All right, everybody all together now. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Please be seated. As a people now, we turn to God again in prayer, this time in confession. The words are in your bulletin. They will be on the screen. That will take us into the Lord's Prayer and then a moment of silent confession as well. Pray with me. Almighty God, through your Son, you have broken sin's hold, and yet we find ourselves under its power, struggling to live into who you intend us to be. Free us that we might live as fully as you intend, and in love help others do the same. In Jesus' name we pray as we have been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Take a moment now in silence to say whatever else needs to be said. In assurance we gather, in hope we bow, and in love we are set free, free from all of those things that bind us, the stuff that we are clear keeps us from being our full selves. In love we are also called, called to share grace and forgiveness and reconciliation with a world that is in need of all of those things. Know that we are forgiven, be at peace, but let us never be still. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Take this time now to pass the peace to those around you. And as you're doing that, let me invite the youth down for our time together. Good morning, good morning. Everybody doing well? It sounds like it. I can feel the enthusiasm coming off of you right now in the moment. Everybody doing well? Better effort that time. We're getting there. It's closer, right? Tell me about the week. What was the best part? Yeah, I bet that was good. New friends. Are y'all still on vacation? Okay, because you, you said vacation there, didn't you, right? Okay, I was like, wait, I thought school had started. That I don't, I didn't go to school. That you didn't have to go yet, rubbing it in, teasing folks, right? There you go, well done. All right, so it was good to see people. Is everybody in school? Is anybody virtual? No? Do what? So it's not even an option. Okay, yeah, see, I, what, I don't know, because because my youngest, Clay, is out. So are you excited? What's going to be the best part about this year? Huh? Say that one more time. No mask. Okay. Being able to see people again, right? You only get like three minutes between class to like go talk to your friends, but like it's fine. 
So three minutes between classes, is that enough time? I mean, it should be like 40, 45, right? So you can talk to people and they're just like three minutes in class. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you have friends in your class, you can talk to them there. Okay. Uh, why do you have minutes in between classes anyway? Why do what? Why are there minutes in between classes? Yeah, so as you get up and up in school, you have to change classes and stuff, and it takes a little while to get there. So they kind of factor that in the schedule. You know, kind of like it takes you all a little bit of time to come down here. And so we kind of factor it into the order of worship, right? Same kind of deal. It's just to make sure y'all have enough time and the teachers have enough time to get ready for you. So it's a cool thing. So is everyone excited? I know it's school, but are you excited to be back? Yeah? yeah. And you're looking forward to it? You're looking forward to all of those things? No, not so much, not yet? Okay. So we're supposed to be like doing field trips and stuff this year, hopefully. So it's going to be going back to normal. Okay. The fun spots? Okay. Oh, to the fun spot, right. I thought you meant fun spots like going to museums and going to libraries and all those cool things where you learn more. That's not the fun spot? That's not the good stuff? No. Learning is fun. You get to grow and you get to become more? Got it. Got it. Yes. So, no, I, see, I don't know anything about it yet. I'm still learning. So that's one of the cool things that as y'all are talking about these places, I'm like, ooh, that would kind of be fun to go check out and see. Oh, right? uh, because um, I'm in the Cambridge thing, um, Cambridge students, um, and sometime in, like, the second semester, I think, we get to go to the Keys for a field trip. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough when they take you to the Keys. Yeah, school's hard. Man, that... That, that's big stuff. The Keys, yeah, it's a pretty sweet place where you get to go swim and hang out, and it's just beautiful. Yeah, you, you, y'all are suffering. We're, we're feeling it. We're feeling it. I'm sure there is great learning that will go on there, but yeah, y'all are, it's hard to be y'all. Well, I'm excited about y'all, and I look forward to hearing about more and more of what y'all are doing, um, and I'm glad that at least most of us are happy to be back in school, and perhaps at the end of it, all of us will be. Um, let's pray. Y'all ready? Thank you for this day and for this time, for this group, for new things ahead and all of the things that that you have in store for them. Let them live as fully and as well as you intend them. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, y'all. I appreciate it much. And again, have a blessed week.
Our gospel reading today is taken from John chapter 6, verses 51 to 58. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. The word of the Lord.
So perhaps you heard a few minutes ago the hum that was in the sanctuary. It was a test that we were doing. So the way it works is this. A couple of weeks ago, uh, there were a couple of the women in the back, and they were greeting, and I was walking in and just kind of walking around, and they looked at me and said, something about you is off today. And my first thought was, if I had a dollar for every woman that said that to me, But my second thought was, well, my ADD is kicking in a little more than normal. And I tried to explain that to them, but they didn't know what it meant. And I said, it's kind of like this hum that exists in your head. And it's just, you never know when it's going to go off. And so perhaps another time in the service, the hum will go again. And we'll go again. And then maybe even again. And the test is, can you hear the hum and still hear? And if you can then perhaps you have ADHD and need speed like I do. (laughs) We gather as a family and we get to offer ourselves to God again in prayer. And so as we do, let me lift up a couple of things. On a personal note, I ask you to lift up my mother-in-law in in your thoughts and prayers. We got word this week that she suffered a a minor stroke, and, and I don't know any more than that. Um, But Becky flew out this morning, Becky, my wife, flew out this morning to go to Alaska to see her. Where my mother-in-law lives is kind of in rural Alaska, and I know if you've been to Alaska for pretty much that is redundant, all of Alaska is rural, but that is where she lives, and so um, she lives by herself, and it is approaching winter in Alaska, which is the best time, of course, of the year in Alaska, uh, especially if you're living by yourself in the middle of nowhere. sarcasm. (laughs) Becky tells me all the time I'm not as funny as I think I am, but. So uh, she flew up just to put eyes and hands on her. As I know more, I will let you know more. We ask prayers for the Lehman family. Um, They're with us this morning, and so it is good to see the majority of the crew this morning. I know there are grandkids and great-grandkids. Bob Lehman passed away this week. We will be celebrating his life and bearing witness to the resurrection Saturday coming up, Saturday morning, and so I invite you to be part of that as well, either in presence or in spirit. As we pray for the world, I ask that you keep our brothers and sisters in Haiti in your thoughts and prayers. First, it was Fred that hit them this week, and then an earthquake, and now there is another storm that is approaching The Haitians will say they are a strong people, and you have to be to endure and live where they live. Please keep them in your thoughts and prayers, as well as the Middle East, as we get news this week that all of the unrest is intensifying again and again and again. Let's pray together. We come before you as your people, and we thank you for the privilege of being able to bow. It reminds us to be humble, to gather in spirit, to gather in presence, to be real for another. It also reminds us of our place before you, a clear sign that you are God and we are not. We are aware that other signs are offered as well, and we ask that you would open our eyes to them, to the signs and the sights that we see in a new day. To the sounds that we hear as creation sings of your praise, to the wonder that we see as we look in the face of another and we see the image of you. We ask, Lord, that you be with the things that are happening in our midst. In this family, we ask that you be with the layman's in particular, but all those that are experiencing some kind of loss or pain. Let them know that. At no time are we alone as our people. You are with us. But so too are those who've gathered in love and presence and have helped form us into who we are. We ask, Lord, that you be with the things that are happening in the world, the things that happen naturally and the things that we do to ourselves. Where there is pain, where there is destruction, where there is brokenness, where there is suffering, We ask that you would sow the seeds of healing and of grace and of reconciliation and of new life. 
Each time we gather, we thank you for the gift of your Son, who is our hope, who is our joy. And we ask, Lord, that you would let us live lives together worthy of the calling that you placed on us. In the rest of our time, we ask that you would speak to us. We're not picky about how you do, just that you speak. So that we might leave today with a better understanding of who we are and of whose we are. In your name we pray. So I know we are still figuring each other out, but I also know that by this time you know that I am a storyteller. And part of what I do is tell stories because I think faith is based on story. The story that we have in the scriptures, but the story that we have in the Judeo-Christian church. What we learn from our brothers and sisters of Judaism, but what we learn from our brothers and sisters of Christianity as well. And all the other tribes that are beyond us. And how our stories come together and how we share truths and how we share things that are real and how we share parts of who we are. And through stories, we invite others into our lives and we get the privilege of having others invite us into theirs. I think stories are some of the greatest gifts that we have been offered and they are some of the greatest gifts that we offer to others. And so I use stories in my sermons, but I use them in my teachings and I use them in my day-to-day conversations. What I have found is they are easy ways to talk about truth, and they are easy ways to talk about love, and they're easy ways to talk about things that are real. I try really hard to share with you stories that are mine. And what is possession in a story? What I mean by that is they are stories that I have seen, or that I have heard, or that I have experienced. When I'm sharing with you a story that is not mine, I make sure I tell you. For example, the story I'm fixing to tell you right now is not mine. It is not one that I know for sure to be true. In today's time, with the internet, all of that, I know you can fact check it. Hear me, if you fact check it and it turns out to be false, do not tell me. Because this is one of those stories that is so good, I want so desperately for it to be true. And so if you tell me it is not, I'm going to ignore you. Because I will tell it again and again and again. I love this story. It goes like this. We are now in the Cold War, so go back with me 40 years. We're thinking 70s, 80s. In that time where where tension between the United States and the Soviet Union was high, Somehow there was an international competition. I don't think it was the Olympics, but think Olympics, something like that. In this particular event, there were only two teams in the event, one from the Soviet Union and one from the United States. The team from the United States won. The team from the Soviet Union got second, or last in this case, because there were only two teams in this event. The headlines in the papers the next day in the Soviet Union, so in my mind, Moscow or someplace like that, the headlines in the papers said this, USSR team finishes second, United States next to last. (laughs) Presentation is everything. How we present things sometimes is more important than what we are presenting. You wouldn't go to a nice restaurant and expect them to feed you on paper plates with plastic silverware. Unless you are my middle child or you are applying to be a basketball coach, you would not go to an interview in basketball shorts and a t-shirt. Presentation is important. You know this. I'm not saying anything new. Prior to my coming here to interview, I know that things got painted around the church. Things got trimmed. Things got cut. The idea was we can get it and looking as good as we can. That has continued since I've been here. We, and by we, I mean the worship committee and Bob and Karen, we are working on the slides trying our best to present them in ways that are good and easy to follow. It's not just a visual thing. It's not just a superficial thing. How we present things, how we present ourselves makes a statement 
about us, but as people of faith, it also makes a statement about God. And whether we realize it or not, the way we present things, sometimes they are very theological. Clay and I were playing pickleball yesterday, and after we did, we went to lunch with the group that we were playing pickleball with. It was an outdoor place. It was kind of set up, family seating, big, long picnic tables. It was the most crowded I've seen this place, which God bless them, good for them, that's awesome, but it kind of stunk for the rest of us. And so there was a line, and it was kind of like being at an amusement park, you know, kind of a line out the door, everyone's getting their food, and they're going and getting their tables. And so you can picture the scene, right? And this is one of those places that kind of turns and burns. You're really there for like 20 minutes. You're getting your food, you're eating a little bit of talk, and then you're going. I mean, that's kind of the purpose of it. It's not sit down and hang out for an hour. And so as people are coming and getting in line, they are seeing the crowds, and they are starting to take place at table. And and their people are still in line because they are afraid there won't be a seat when they are coming out. Scarcity is what we are presenting, or at least they were presenting. It's a theological statement as well. When we talk about scarcity, what are we saying? There was plenty of room at the tables. There was plenty of time for people. None of the families had children that could not wait. Without even realizing it, the image they were saying was scarcity. I've done this too. But we have a God who is a God of abundance, not one who provides unlimited resources. The question for us is, as we are presenting things, not just faith, not just the church, not just ourselves, what is the underlying message of what we are saying? Because here's the deal. Sometimes the way we present things can enable a person or prevent a person or a group of people from living fully into new life. It is a theological statement. It is a life-breathing, a life-giving statement. Or sometimes it is a statement that keeps people stuck. And stuck. And stuck. We see that as we read today. We are going to read in just a minute from 1 Kings. Before we do, let's talk a little bit about 1 Kings, because I know it's a book all y'all know so much about and you spend so much time in. 1 Kings, it is in the Old Testament, and where we are going to read, it is in a critical point in our brothers' and sisters' lives, because what is happening in the moment is David, the second king of Israel, this is a time when Israel is one nation, David has just died. And so what that means is our brothers and sisters have lost has, have perhaps the, their best king, their most beloved king. And so as you can imagine, there is now a void in leadership. It may be just for a minute, but there is a void. And with that void, there is uncertainty and there is anxiety. Who's going to take the place now? Who's going to come to the throne? Where are we going? What are we going to do? And the community is not sure where they are going. But they have not lost just just their king. They have also lost their major psalmist. Right or wrong, David is credited with writing most of the psalms in the Old Testament. There are 150 of them. If you read the top of them and it says who wrote them, David probably wrote 122 of them. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but he is credited with writing the vast majority of them. So our brothers and sisters have lost not just their king, they have lost the one who has been responsible for putting their faith into words that become part of the soul. Because that's what music does. The words that we sing and the words that are put to music, they become part of who we are. We know this. And as preachers, it's hard to admit because no one goes home humming and quoting sermons. What they do is they go home humming and quoting songs. So our brothers and sisters, they have lost their king, yes, but they have also lost the one who is putting words into music that become part of who they are, and that's probably the greatest loss for them. The story goes like this. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. Is there a more graceful way of saying David has passed away? 
he slept with his ancestors. I mean, think about what is presented in that one sentence. David is no longer with us. He has passed. But he is with his ancestors, those who have passed before him. As Christians, there is a word that we use for this. But our brothers and sisters are talking about resurrection very clearly. David has passed. He is no longer living, but he is with now his ancestors, and there is life in some other form, and we don't get it. We don't understand it yet. And I don't mean that just about our Jewish brothers and sisters. We as Christians don't always understand it either. But what they are saying and what they are claiming and what they are presenting is that just because he is gone, he is not gone. And just because he is gone, folks are not going to see him again. The implication is really clear. David is past and he is with his ancestors, and one day you will be with them too. The concept, the words, the phrase, the things they are presenting is resurrection. It is new life. It is this idea that life is a purpose, that we are created for a meaning. We are created for something real. We are created to be in relationship. And that relationship does not stop when we stop breathing. It takes on a different form. We experience it in different ways. But from the beginning of the story, the story that shapes us all, what is clear is that life does not stop when it stops here. I don't fully get resurrection. I'll be the first to admit that. I don't fully get afterlife. But when that time comes for me, I want people presenting it this way. Chris is not here. He's with his ancestors. And one day we'll all be connected again. There is something beautiful. There is something hopeful. There is something awesome about that. But in the hope and in the grace, it's easy to forget that they are now rudderless. They have no king. And all the anxiety is dropping away, but it will pick back up when they realize that, of course, though, they have a king. They just don't know it yet. Let's talk about it and let's present what's real, and then let's move into tomorrow. Then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. And so Solomon sat on his throne the throne of his father David, and he established, and his kingdom was firmly established. And, and what the story is trying to make clear is that they are not rudderless, but Solomon is there, and life will go on. This is how healthy bodies function. They know change is part of life, it is not always something that we welcome, but it is part of life. And what it does, it allows new life to spring forth in ways that we cannot possibly imagine, but assure us that there is a tomorrow and a purpose for tomorrow, and then a tomorrow after that, and a tomorrow after that, and there is a purpose for all of them. You get this. And I don't even know that you do, and that's the beautiful part of it. I am two months, two and a half months in our relationship together. And I think one of the beautiful things I appreciate about that relationship is the way y'all talk and claim your history. I should say our history because I'm part of it. It's the way we talk and claim our history and as you are talking to me about the past, and we have 75 years of a past, and talking about, to me, those people who have held my place, you do so with love and respect and kindness and gentleness. You celebrate them and what they did and who they were in their time that they were with you in ways that say they were awesome and they were here for a purpose. And that purpose was this, and we did this together. And it is a cool way of celebrating that. And the question implied then is, we don't know why you're here. 
but we're in the process of figuring it out. And the cool part is we will figure that out together. And now that I'm here, we can rest, right? Well, we have a former administrator who is here with us this morning, but we have been busy for the past couple of months searching for her replacement because change is part of who we are and change is a part of life. And I am pleased to say that come Tuesday, the personnel committee is going to be presenting to the session a candidate to be her replacement. And hopefully come Tuesday, we will have a new administrative assistant. The beautiful thing in the interim is we have had two people serving in the role that one person held. And they have carried us and they have served beautifully. So come Tuesday, we can rest, right? Well, sometime in the end of this year, Travis, who is not with us today, will cease to be with us as leader of the praise team, the sorry dog. <laughs> Travis never intended to lead the praise team as long as he did. He was serving in an interim in grace and in love while he was doing his thing and going to school. Perhaps he should have been a little bit dumber because he is fixing to graduate <laughs> and get on with doing the stuff he is feeling called to do. And so we will be searching again. In the meantime, we get time with him to celebrate the grace and the love and the energy and the humility with which he has led, but also the grace and the love and the humility with which he has given us time to prepare for that change. It is an incredible gift. And I don't think it's an accident that it gives us, he gives us to us. It shows the quality of the people we have in leadership, but it also shows the beauty of this church and the ways in which you treat people who are leaders because he wanted to make sure he did everything he could to ensure we are as strong and as ready to transition as possible. I know what you're thinking. We have already told Sarah she can't go with him. <laughs> so she will still be here, and we don't know what he's going to do, but... It's not just people, but ministries too. As a church, we have had a beautiful relationship with Eastern Florida State College in this thing called the lab school. And so with the lab school, what we have done is we have partnered with families and we have helped raise generations into amazing and strong families and young men and women, and it has been an awesome partnership. And I have to tell you, I am sad that I never got to see it. It is coming to an end, not the lab school, but just our partnership, at least our physical partnership, because what Eastern Florida has done is it has bought property with the primary intention of building its own lab school on that property so it will no longer need our space. The lab school will continue, just not here. And so the question for us is, what do we do with that space? I mean, we've got classrooms after classrooms. We've got an entire building. And we have the opportunity to use it to impact our community in amazing ways. Who knows what that's going to be? Who knows what it's going to look like? But isn't it awesome to think about? It might be a preschool. It might be a partnership with the Boys and Girls Club. It might be, surely now you are thinking of some things as well. The possibilities are endless. What we know is this, is it will not stay empty. We will do something through grace to impact our community. Because that's who we are. It is part of our nature and part of our calling. And we as a church get this, and that is a beautiful thing. 
I am still new here, and I am still learning. But one of the things I appreciate most about Riverside Presbyterian Church is how we approach change. We may not always like it. We may not always welcome it. But we know it's a part of life. And we know what it does is it gives us the opportunity to breathe new lives into who we are as a people and also into our community. This is a faith thing. And it's centered in this belief that our God is a God of life. It's centered in this belief that resurrection is real, and it's centered in this belief that resurrection is a daily thing. And part of our calling as people of faith is to help people, to help things, to help communities experience new life in ways they never dreamed possible. And this is not normal thinking. Not in the world, and not in the church. I talk to other ministers, not all that often because I don't want to be too connectional, but I talk to other ministers and the things I say, and what they say to me is, yeah, you've only been there a couple months. Wait till you really get to know them. It is something I hope we don't take for granted. It may be part of who we are. but I hope it's something we don't take for granted because it comes with great responsibility. Amid the brokenness in our world today, the question for us is how can we present things that enable others to live fully into life? I'm still new, so I don't know how we're going to do it. But based on what I know of you, I'm confident we will. And I'm excited to see it come to fruition. I hope you are too. Let's pray. We want so many different things for ourselves, for your world, for your kingdom. We want to be full and to live as fully as we are able selfishly for our own sake, but also so others can do the same. Through us, we want people to know your love. We want people to know your grace. We want people to know your hope. We want people to know that what you dream for all of us is dancing with you in fields of grace. Let us be the Christians that you need us to be so that all people in all places know they're invited to the dance. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stay.
As it was my privilege and my pleasure to welcome us, it is my privilege and my pleasure to send us out. I'd remind you and hope that you don't go too far, just to the Fellowship Hall, because we can gather again in fellowship and celebrate the ties that bind us together as one. As a people, let us go in peace, let us go in grace, let us go in hope, and let us go living as fully as we are able, not just for our sakes, so that others may as well. And all God's people said. There's a place where I love to run and play. There's a place where I sing new songs of praise. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. There's a place where I lose myself within There's a place where I find myself again Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace There's a place where religion finally dies There's a place where I lose my selfish pride Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. And I love my Father. My Father loves me. I dance for my Father. My Father sings over me. I love my father, my father loves me, I dance for my father, my father sings over me, and nothing, nothing, nothing can take it away from me, yes, nothing, nothing, nothing can take it away There's a place where religion finally dies. There's a place where I lose my selfish pride. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Dancing with my Father. Father God, it feels a great. 